Uh, I'd like to introduce Tiffany Oldani, uh, and she's going to talk about the Divine Just State Realizing Plato's Republic. Uh, we don't have assigned uh, discussants today, so that means you all are going to be discussing. So I want you to listen attentively and be prepared to uh, discuss. Okay. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm very excited to be talking to you today about the topic of the Divine Just State and its fascinating connection to Plato's Republic. Uh, just to introduce myself and give a little bit of my background, um, I'm from the United States and uh, I come from a Catholic background. I was raised a devout Catholic. Uh, I've been a member of the faith for over 10 years. I joined the community uh, with Upsalik in 2014. And uh, I, I work as the web developer and graphic designer for the Aeropal Studios. And uh, that's my professional background. I used to work in uh, as a creative director. But a lot of uh, my body of work within the call has been uh, focused on Christian outreach, as that is my, my uh, religious background. So um, there's a common thread that exists in many religions, including the Abrahamic religions, that uh, there, will, there will be a man who will come forward at some point in history and he will establish uh, justice upon the earth. This is seen as the sort of ultimate goal of the prophets and the messengers throughout time. And we certainly find it explicitly stated in the scriptures of the Abrahamic faiths, like this verse in the book of Jeremiah that says, in those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. And in this narration, the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, says, Allah will raise a man from my progeny, from my Ahl Bayt, whom, by whom the earth will be filled with justice thoroughly, the same as it has been filled with injustice and oppression. Now, I think we can all agree that that sounds really nice and that we would like to live in a state of justice. But in order to understand what that looks like practically and what that really means, we have to ask ourselves the question, what does justice mean? Now, if we turn to the dictionaries, we find a lot of different definitions and they don't necessarily agree with one another. And we even find circular arguments where the word is being defined by using the word. So in order to really understand what justice means, we have to dig deeper. We have to travel back to ancient Athens and take a look at the Republic, a, a work by Plato, which records the teachings of his teacher, Socrates. Now, the Republic is a translation of a title that could more accurately be translated as the state or the ideal state. And the entire topic at hand throughout the Republic is the idea of justice, what it means on an individual level and what it means uh, at a societal level. But before we dig deep into the contents of the Republic, uh, I think it's important that we take a moment to talk about Socrates himself and why he is so important within this faith. Socrates was the teacher of Plato, who in turn was the teacher of Aristotle. And these three figures are, are seen as sort of the founding fathers of Western philosophy. They are three patriarchs of philosophy, and they're every bit as important to people who hold philosophy uh, as, as important as the three righteous patriarchs of the Abrahamic religions, namely Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And uh, it might surprise some people to realize uh, or, or to learn this, but these figures were actually spoken about by Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him and his family. He actually confirmed that Aristotle was a prophet, but his people did not recognize him as such. And he even went so far as to compare himself to Aristotle by saying, I am the Aristotle of this nation. Now, uh, it's not typical that uh, the, the, the founding fathers of Greek philosophy are associated with Prophet Muhammad, so this is uh, something very unusual. But once we, once we start to compare the teachings of uh, Socrates with the teachings that have been brought forward in this call, we find that they actually align. And philosophy is really, uh, it's at its core, a, a study of the fundamental nature of knowledge, reality, and existence. So uh, what would that be if not a, a journey to understand the nature of the divine? Uh, it was written in the goal of the wise that a philosopher is a divinely appointed prophet, messenger, imam, or vicegerent. And Imam Ahmed al-Hassan from him as peace has informed us that Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle were all prophets. So that is one of the revelations that came with the Seventh Covenant, that these people, uh, the philosophers who, who were so influential in forming Western thought were actually prophets of God. And it doesn't end there, actually. We find that these figures were not the only people who were re revealed to be prophets of God. 
we actually believe that there were many uh, unknown prophets, previously unknown prophets, such as Zeus, Pythagoras, Cyrus the Great, Zoroaster, Buddha, Krishna, Lao Tzu, and Confucius, just to name a few names. Uh, these figures uh, who have been so influential in both the West and the East, uh, they have been confirmed within this call to be prophets of God, meaning they were sent by the same God as Abraham. So that is a, a really profound revelation within this faith. Uh, and this matches what is written in the Holy Quran, which actually states that uh, we have already sent messengers before you, and among them are those whose stories we have related to you, and among them are those whose stories we have not related to you. Meaning there are, there are prophets who are not mentioned in the scriptures, and in the, the Bible and in the Quran, there are less than 100 figures mentioned, but uh, somebody mentioned earlier, and this is something that we believe, uh, it's, it's stated in the narrations that there were actually 124,000 prophets and messengers sent by God. So that's quite a, a big number. Uh, now that we have sort of uh, proven that there are unknown prophets of God and that Socrates and Plato were among them, uh, let's take a little uh, look at some of the teachings that Socrates put forward and compare them with some of the teachings that were put forward in this call. One of the questions that Socrates sought to answer is uh, the definition of wisdom. He was going around and he was looking for the wisest person in the land. And he came to the conclusion that uh, while he doesn't know, he doesn't suppose that he knows. And for that reason, he must actually be pretty wise. So his definition of wisdom can be summarized uh, as saying, the only true wisdom is in knowing that you know nothing. And that is exactly how Ahmed al-Hassan defined the concept. He said, the uttermost knowing is knowing that you are unable to know the truth. Another uh, interesting connection between the teachings of Socrates and the teachings that are brought forward in this call uh, is the idea that questioning things is important. So you're probably familiar with the Socratic method. It is seen as a foundational teaching within law school, and it is a form of disciplined question asking that uh, asks the, the person to think through a problem with logic by asking questions until you arrive at the, uh, at the truth. And this is a method that, that is named after Socrates because that's exactly what he did. He had a habit of going around a Athens and asking people question after question. And uh, ultimately, he, he had a habit of embarrassing uh, the people that, that he was speaking to because he would poke holes in their logic and uh, people didn't really like that. <laughs> uh, Socrates uh, didn't, he didn't, uh, I'm so sorry. Is it okay if I have a seat? I'm, uh, I'm pregnant and I think I would be a little bit more comfortable. <laughs> I'm finding that I'm a bit short of breath, so sorry, bear with me. Okay, so Socrates, he said that the, the unexamined life is, is not worth living. And these are actually some of his, his last words because he was, uh, he was brought up on charges and sentenced to death. And he said that he didn't, uh, he didn't regret what he had done, questioning everything, because that for him was the entire purpose of existence. And uh, something that we find in this call, which is actually very unusual in the context of religion, is that uh, ah Ahmed al-Hassan and Abu Sadiq from the Mispeace, they encourage people to ask questions. Because we, we consider ourselves companions of the evidence. Uh, we, we like to go where the evidence leads us, wherever that may be. And Imam Ahmed al-Hassan said, search for your religion until you are called crazy. Rather, I say, search for your religion until they call you a disbeliever. So uh, that's something that most, most faiths don't really encourage. They don't encourage that you question your faith. But uh, we believe that, that that is the only way to arrive at the truth. And one of those questions uh, that Socrates was really determined to ask and uh, arrive at the answer to is, what is justice? Uh, that is the, the question at the heart of the Republic. He is having a conversation with several individuals and each one of them, much like the, the dictionary definitions which we took a look at earlier, they had a different way of defining justice. Catholics believe that it was being truthful and returning what one owes. Polymarchus believe that it's helping one's friend and harming one's enemies. And Thrasymachus believe that it's the advantage of the stronger. Uh, but Socrates used his, his logic and his questioning abilities to kind of disprove these different ideas. He said that it couldn't possibly be uh, being truthful and returning what one owes because if your friend uh, lends you a weapon when he's in his sane mind and then he goes out of his mind, it wouldn't be just to return the weapon to him. 
And helping one's friends and harming one's enemies can't be just because you don't necessarily know who is your friend and who is your enemy. And I think we can all agree that the advantage of the stronger uh, has led to the worst possible outcome many times throughout history. So what is justice? Well, Socrates had a different way of defining it. He basically said that, that within a society, every person has to perform the service which they are most suited for and to basically stay in, stay in their lane and mind their business. And uh, his philosophy on justice can basically be summarized as to say justice is the result of everything being in the correct place. And this is exactly how Imam Ahmed al-Hassan defined the concept. He said that justice means placing something into its right place. I think we can uh, take a practical example to, to illustrate uh, that it wouldn't make sense to put somebody whose nature and education and training is best suited for being a doctor and take this person and put them to work on a farm the same way that we wouldn't want uh, somebody who's trained as a farmer working as our doctor. It just wouldn't be just. They would be in the wrong place. Now, uh, the interlocutors uh, of Socrates, they, they had uh, questions and they wanted to know uh, really what this would look like practically, what justice would look like practically. So Socrates, he had an interesting proposal. He said that he wanted to uh, look at justice both on an individual level and in a society. And what he was saying with that is basically that the just individual is the same as a just society. It's the same thing, but just on a different scale. So uh, first, let's talk about what justice looks like within the individual, according to Socrates. He said that there are three parts of the embodied soul. So the first part is the appetite of self. It's driven by its desires. It's located in the stomach. It loves pleasure, good food, good drink, uh, particularly money. Uh, it's associated with the cardinal virtue of moderation. And you can compare it to this uh, multi-headed beast or hydra creature, where if you chop one of the heads off, two more will sprout up. So in other words, it can never really be satisfied. The next aspect of the, the soul is the spirited self, which is driven by emotion, located in the chest, uh, loves honor and victory, and seeks those things. And it's associated with the cardinal virtue of courage, can be compared to a noble lion. Uh, next, we have the rational self, which is driven by logic, and uh, it's located in the brain, and it loves truth and wisdom, and it seeks truth and wisdom above all else. Next, we have, uh, uh, sorry, and it can be compared to a human being, and it's associated with the cardinal virtue of wisdom. And funnily enough, we can actually find these cardinal virtues uh, on the wall of this very room. And according to Socrates, uh, these virtues, wisdom, courage, and moderation, when they're in the correct place of the individual, they produce justice. Justice is like a balance of the soul's parts, and injustice is an imbalance. And the just individual is the one who's being ruled by what? The human being, the rational self. That is the, the just individual. In another one of uh, Plato's dialogues, Socrates talks about and compares it to a chariot, which is being driven uh, by two horses and led, uh, sorry, led by two horses and driven by a charioteer. The two horses represent the appetitive and the spirits itself, and the charioteer is the, the rational self or the human being. And uh, we can see what justice would be. It would be that the human being is the one running the show here. And it's not just in the philosophy of Socrates and, and Plato that we find this concept of a tripartite self or embodied, uh, embodied soul. We find the same thing uh, being mentioned in the scriptures of Islam. So in the Quran, there's mention of a self that commands evil, which can be compared to the appetite of self, a self that is at peace, which can be compared to the spirited self. And we have narrations which speak about the intellect. And I want to read this because I think that what it says is really important for us to understand. Allah the glorious, the majestic, created intelligence, and it was the first creature of the spiritual world on the right side of the throne from his light. He then told him to move backwards, so intelligence moved backwards. He then told it to come forward, so intelligence came forwards. So what can we learn about the, the rational self or the intellect from this narration? The, that is the aspect of the self which uh, listens to God or is obedient to God or is ruled by God, essentially. The same way that there are three aspects to the individual, there, uh, Socrates said that a just society would be divided into three uh, segments or classes, for lack of a better word. The first class is the producer class, and this class would include people like doctors, farmers, tradespeople, um, artisans, people who produce for the society. 
The next class is the warrior class or the auxiliary class, and these people would live in a different way. They wouldn't uh, be allowed to own property, they would live communally, they would make great sacrifices uh, for the benefit of the state. And then a select group of this warrior class would be taken to be the, the ruler class or the guardian class. Um, each of the traits of the soul that we just talked about is, is dominant in each person. So that has to do with where they would be sorted into a just society. So uh, those in which the appetite of self is the most dominant are, are better suited for being producers. Those in which the spirited self is most dominant are better suited for being warriors. And those uh, who are ruled by the rational self are the most ideal candidates for being rulers. And each of these uh, uh, classes uh, in, within society is uh, corresponding to one of the cardinal virtues. And the entire society uh, has the philosopher king at the top of the pyramid ruling. If we want to compare uh, this to an example uh, that we see practically uh, existing in the world today, we can take a look at the structure of the church, uh, the Catholic church, uh, in which there are lay people, there are clergy, and then a select group of those clergy are taken to be part of the council of cardinals, uh, who are the close companions and rulers within the church, and, and they are uh, amongst the pope who is in the seat of the philosopher king. And uh, this is an interesting example because the Catholic Church is actually a faith which has a sovereign state in Vatican City. Now, these ideas that Socrates put forward weren't without controversy. And one of the controversies or questions that he was asked by one of his interlocutors is whether the guardians would be happy living in this way. Because as I mentioned, they make great sacrifices on behalf of the state. They live communally and they, they share in all things, including uh, families and, and children. Uh, and Socrates argued that the nature of these guardians actually meant that they would be satisfied by living this way, that the, the essence of their soul would be satisfied by living in this way, and it would be most beneficial for society because in this way they would become a true family. Uh, he said, but would any of your guardians think or speak of another guardian as a stranger? Certainly he would not, for everyone whom they, they will meet will be regarded by them either as a brother or a sister or father or mother or son or daughter, or as a child or parent of those who are thus connected with him. So we find that it, you know, you're most uh, protective over your family, right? So in this way, the guardians would view all people at, as their family and they would be most protective over the state above all else. So it had a benefit in society. The second aspect of uh, controversy that I want to mention that, uh, that has been seen as controversial uh, in this text is the noble lie or what has been called the noble lie. And there are two aspects to the noble lie. Uh, the first aspect is that the, the souls, they were existing in the earth and they were formed and they were trained in the earth before they, they entered the material uh, world. And for this reason, they were infused with certain metals. So the, the people who were best suited to be rulers were infused with the metal of gold. The people who were best suited to be warriors were infused with the metal of silver. And the people who were best suited to be uh, part of the producer class were infused with this copper or iron material. And uh, that there was something in, what he's basically saying is that there's something in the essence of the soul, which means it's best suited for a certain place in society. Uh, it might kind of remind you of the, the sorting hat uh, in Harry Potter, but this example just goes to show that it is not such a foreign concept in our cultural lore that there would be something, uh, some aspect of a person that makes them best suited for a certain role. And perhaps that is because uh, this concept has survived throughout the ages in the writings of Plato, but it has survived as a lie or a myth. But there are a couple of issues with that. Socrates himself spoke out against lies. He called them murderers of the truth. His whole life quest was basically uncovering the truth. So it would be very unusual that Socrates would propagate a lie. And the second uh, thing that I want to mention is that we, there are prophecies that do exist within Islam that really match what the noble light is stating, which is that the souls were created in another place. They existed in another place before they entered the bodies. And uh, the character of the Qaim or the riser is the one who will come forward and he will sort them according to where they should be. Uh, and if we take a look back at the definition of justice, which is putting things in their correct place, this becomes rather interesting. The narration uh, states that verily God chose between the souls in the shadows and then made them enter the bodies. 
And if our crime emerges, he shall make the brother inherit from the brother whom God paired with him in the shadows, and he does not make him inherit from his physical brother. Know him from that, and whoever knows him from that, there shall remain upon him no further no uh, remain upon him a stronger proof. There shall not remain upon him a stronger proof. So this is uh, this is one of the the proofs by which the the riser uh, proves himself to the people. So he is the one who is able to sort people according to uh, their reality. That's a really fascinating connection to the teachings of Socrates, certainly. And if we take a look back at the scriptures, we can find that there were indications uh, and hints at this in the scriptures from the prophets and the messengers previously. So in the Bible, Jesus said, uh, one day Jesus was with his disciples and his mother and his brothers came and they wanted to see him. And he, he said to his disciples, uh, here are my mother and my brothers, uh, meaning them. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my, is my brother and my sister and my mother. So he's indicating that there is this spiritual kinship that supersedes the physical kinship. And it's written in the Holy Quran that verily the, sibling, the, the believers are siblings. And this verse actually corresponds to an event that happened in Islamic history where Prophet Muhammad had two groups of believers with him. He had the, the Ansar and the Mahajarun who had migrated with him. And he actually paired between these two groups brothers. And he made them brothers in all senses of the word. And this was very controversial if you take a look at the historical context of Prophet Muhammad where tribalism was really the dominant uh, structure and uh, the genetic and fam familial relationships were really valued. He basically uh, said by doing this that there is a spiritual kinship uh, that should supersede the physical kinship. And uh, the last uh, verse that I, I will share on this topic is that Imam Ali said, two friends are a single soul in different bodies. So certainly we have indications that there is this spiritual connection between people and uh, that the physical reality is not necessarily reflecting that. Now, at this point, uh, Socrates had convinced his interlocutors that his definition of justice was solid and that his plan for instating justice was, uh, was, a, was a beneficial for society. But they had one question. They wanted to know, is the just state possible? Is it possible to implement such a thing? And what Socrates said in response to this question is very important to this faith. Uh, he, he said, until philosophers are kings or the kings and princes of this world have the spirit and power of philosophy, Cities will never have rest from their evils, no, nor the human race, as I believe. And then only will our state have a possibility of light and behold uh, of life and behold the light of day. So what he's saying here is that the, the entire implementation of justice hinges upon just one thing, and that is the rulership of the philosopher king. Now, we know that the philosopher king plays a crucial role. But I want us to understand what differentiates the philosopher king from the rest of creation. And in order to do that, we have to take a look at the theory of forms, which Socrates uh, speaks about in the Republic. The theory of forms basically uh, posits that the, the physical world that we live in is like a, like a bad copy or a shadow of reality, which is the realm of forms. Uh, in the realm of forms, things are non-physical, eternal, immutable, immutable, and perfect, as opposed to our physical, transient, mutable, and imperfect world. And within the, like, the, sorry, within the realm of forms, there is a hierarchy. So in our world, we have particulars, and particulars are the tangible objects that we, that we can see and touch and feel, like houses and horses and trees and flowers, for example. And these things correspond to concepts that exist in the realm of forms. Uh, and then the higher realm, uh, the higher forms are concepts such as justice and beauty. And the very pinnacle of the realm of forms is the form of good. And the form of good can be compared to the sun, just like the sun lights the sensible world so that we can see. The form of good uh, provides the light of reason in the intelligible world so that we can know the forms. The form of good is that which imparts truth to the known and the power of knowing to the knower. And to really illustrate uh, the, the concept of the realm of forms, he put forth the allegory of the cave, with the famous allegory of the cave. And he asks us to imagine that we are like prisoners who are in a dark cave, and they've been there since birth, and they've never seen anything else. They know no other reality. They're chained against this wall. And behind the wall, there's a fire. And in between the wall and the fire, there's this walkway where people sometimes pass holding objects. 
Now, the fire causes the, the objects to cast a shadow on the back wall. And the people who are chained, uh, they only see these shadows and they think that that's reality because they don't know any different. Until one day, one of the prisoners manages to break free and to actually escape the cave and to see the light of day. And at first he's blinded, he's shocked, he can't believe what he's seeing. Uh, but then in time, he comes to study the, the, the realm of the reality which is around him, which is representing the realm of forms. And the freed prisoner is, is like the philosopher or the philosopher king uh, who, becomes, who reaches this state of, of gnosis or knowing the true reality. And he doesn't want to return to the cave. He doesn't want to return to this dark and ignorant place, but he sees it as an obligation upon himself that he has to go back and inform the prisoners that what they think is reality is actually just opinions and illusions. Now, we find a parallel between this concept of the realm of forms put forth by Socrates in the Republic and uh, what the Ahl Bayt said regarding the uh, existence of a door and a name and a meaning attached to God. This, uh, this concept exists specifically in Islamic Gnosticism. And Imam Ahmed al-Hassan wrote about it in the Book of Monotheism and explained what these, uh, what these three things are actually talking about. Monotheism in the first rank is knowing that all of these names, you might be familiar with the 99 names of God, in reality there's much more, but they describe uh, attributes of God. Uh, all of these names are encompassed or gathered in the divine essence, meaning that Allah is Rahman, Rahim, merciful, intensely merciful, and that mercy is his essence, and he is able, and ability is his essence. So they are describing the essence, but they are not the essence. Uh, the names and descriptions and attributes are from the aspect of the creation's need for it, for their existence is from the aspect of the poverty of the creation, which means we are like those prisoners who are chained up in, in the, the cave. We, we are actually unable to grasp the true reality. But there is somebody who is able to grasp the true reality, and that is the door. Now, who is the door? Uh, he says, and knowing the essence or Allah is obtained from the door. And the door is the family of Muhammad and the Imams and the Mahdi's. They are the doors of knowing. So in other words, the philosopher king is the door of knowing reality. So this makes him uniquely suited for his role. He is different from all of creation. And uh, in the book of monotheism, Imam Ahmed al-Hassan also states that monotheism is tied to the caliphs or the vicegerents of God with a very tight bond. Rather, if we accurately check the matter, we would know that from what has been presented that knowing and monotheism are not possible for the rest of creation if it weren't for the first created being or the first mind or Muhammad, peace be upon him and his family, who made the creation know him. So their, their existence is crucial, the philosopher king. And, and they are so divorced from this physical reality and seek only God to the point that they, they die a sort of ego death. And this is something that both Prophet Muhammad and Socrates spoke about. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him and his family said, die before your death. And Socrates said, the true philosophers practice dying and death is less terrible to them than any other men. Consider it this way, they are in every way hostile to the body and they desire to have the soul apart by itself. So uh, they seek only God and that is what differentiates them from the rest of creation. Okay, now that we've established who the philosopher king is, why he's different from the rest of creation, let's uh, play devil's advocate for a moment and consider the, the other options for, for governance because some people might say that, that the aristocracy with the philosopher king at the helm is not the ideal. Socrates uh, he did just that in the Republic. He, he, he discussed four other states uh, of governance as states of deviation from the ideal. So uh, aristocracy with the philosopher king ruling is the ideal, according to Socrates. Uh, but it could fail if injustice starts to occur in the individuals, meaning the, the guardians start to want to own property, they start to get a little bit greedy, and uh, this results in timocracy. This is a little bit worse. Uh, in this, in this uh, society, a class of property and business owners lead, and it fails when it becomes just about a few of them, uh, and this leads to oligarchy. And this is where we have this big stratification of wealth, where there's an extremely wealthy class and an extremely poor class, and the wealthy are few and the poor are many. And the people rebel against the system, wanting a say. And this is when we, we get democracy. And uh, Socrates had choice words about democracy. He said that it was basically the, the rule of the mob of men. Uh, it's a rule by popular vote. And he said that in this system, unqualified individuals lead and conflicts of interest are, are rampant. 
uh, which you can imagine if, a, if a, a person who's a business owner is in the position of leadership, then they have a vested interest in passing certain legislation that benefits them personally. So we see that this leads to conflicts of interest and their nature is not best suited for ruling. Uh, this, this system is what Socrates ultimately said fails when one person becomes a demagogue or a tyrant. Uh, he, he could present himself as a champion of the people. So um, democracy has the, according to Socrates, has the ability to appeal to this appetite of self of the person. So uh, a person comes and they say, I'm, I'm your champion, I'm the people's champion. They elect him and then that gives him the opportunity to seize power. And that's exactly what Socrates predicted would happen. He said that a person will seize power, become a tyrant and, and do all that he can to hold on to that power. And even this system uh, is destined to fail when certain people want justice uh, re-established, uh, they want the just system re-established and an aristocratic coalition uh, rebels and reinstates aristocracy with the philosopher king at the helm. Now, when we consider the language of the narrations that talk about the Kaim, who, who is the character who's said to bring justice upon the earth, it says he fills the earth with justice just as it was filled with tyranny. So there we have this sort of uh, restarting of the cycle uh, that, that tyranny ultimately uh, can give birth to justice. And it is in fact the opposite of justice. So it might seem surprising for some people uh, who are not so aware of it that philosophy, uh, sorry, that ancient Athens basically gave us two things, right? It is the birthplace of both philosophy and democracy. But these concepts are, are at odds with one another. And this was basically the warning that Socrates gave that, that, sorry, that democracy ultimately leads to tyranny. Uh, and it matches what is written in the Abrahamic scriptures. In the Holy Quran, it says, if you follow the majority of people on earth, they will lead you astray from the path of God. And we, look, we have to look no further than to the example of Jesus Christ to see how this has actually happened in religious history. Jesus uh, was brought forth in front of a group of people and uh, he, the people were given the choice, either free Jesus or free this criminal by the name of Barabbas. And the people unanimously voted to free Baraba and to put Jesus to death. And uh, there's an example in the Old Testament where uh, the Israelites, they, they did not want the prophet Samuel's children to be his successors. And uh, they, they asked for Samuel to ask God to appoint a ruler for, a, a king over them, sorry, a king over them, not just a ruler. And they didn't even have the, the audacity to ask to elect a ruler themselves. It didn't even occur to them to, that they could choose the ruler. They went to God and they asked, choose a king for us. But just that was taken, was tantamount as a rejection of God himself. Uh, and God said, it is not you that they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. So it is clear that it, from the Abrahamic scriptures that God wants to select the ruler and that, that this is in the benefit of the people, that God is the one who chooses the ruler. And in the, the time of Socrates, that would have been Socrates. If the Calipolis or the, the just state had been instated in the time of Socrates, he would have been the ideal philosopher king. But Socrates wasn't very popular with the people. Uh, Socrates, he, he spoke some uncomfortable truths for the people. But there were a certain type of people that were very popular in his time, and, and that's the poets. And Socrates mm -hmm. talked in depth about the poets and why their existence was actually not great for society. He said, there's an old quarrel between philosophy and poetry. And here on the left, I, left uh, we have a, a bust of one of the most uh, famous and prolific poets in the time of Socrates, and that is Homer. Uh, Homer was, was well loved by the people. And of course, Socrates himself here on the right. And uh, this quarrel between philosophy and poetry goes back to the concept of mimesis or imitation. Now, consider how far something can deviate from its reality. And we'll, we'll use the example of a couch. We have the form of a couch, and then we have the particular of a couch, and then we have a painting of a couch. So the reality of the couch is the form, and it deviates all the way to the painting of the couch. But imagine how, how inaccurate a painting of a couch would be if the person had never even seen the subject or they had no knowledge of it. 
And that's exactly what, what Socrates was saying was happening with the poets. They were portraying things which they had no knowledge of. Particularly, they were portraying the gods, like Zeus and other gods from the Greek pantheon, uh, as, as mere mortal men. When we know, and we, have, we spoke about it earlier, many of the gods from the Greek pantheon, including Zeus, were actually prophets of God. He said, when anyone images badly in his speech the true nature of gods and heroes, like a painter whose portraits bear no resemblance to his models, it is certainly right to condemn things like that. So according to Socrates, it is damaging to society for people to be taught lies about holy figures, uh, men uh, who, who were appointed vicegerents of God. And we find very similar warnings taking place in the scriptures. Jesus said, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. So he's saying that there are people who imitate uh, true prophets, but inwardly they are not, and they have no knowledge of God. And there is an entire surah in the Holy Quran called the poets. As for poets, only the misguided follow them. Do not see that they roam confusedly through all the valleys of falsehood, thoughts, and currents, and they say what they themselves do not do. So this is a recurrent theme throughout the religions that there are these people who come forward and they claim to be knowledgeable about God, but they are, they are deceiving people and they're misguiding people. Um, and who are the, po the poets of modern times? Imam Ahmed al-Hassan warned against them. He said, I'm calling you, O people, to save yourself from the test of those deviant, misguided, misguiding clerics. So in other words, uh, the, the poets that Socrates was talking about are the non-working scholars, the people who have elevated themselves to the position of the philosopher king, who claim to know and uh, have knowledge of God when they have no divine appointment and they have no, no right to speak on God's behalf. So time after time, we find that the teachings of Socrates align with the teachings of this call. And this call is a revival of long forgotten truths. And this call actually is a call that unites uh, belief systems from all over the world. So it's really important to, to study things like this, where we see seemingly uh, different belief systems, like uh, the, the teachings of the philosophers, the, the Greek philosophers, and the teachings uh, of Islam. Uh, but we find that they actually align perfectly. And who would have thought that the key to understanding the, the justice which is spoken about in the prophecies uh, that talk about uh, a man coming forward from the family of Muhammad and establishing justice, that the key to understanding this was actually in the writings of Socrates. Because the, the figure of the Qaim or the riser is the philosopher king that Socrates spoke about so long ago. And he is the one who is uniquely able and suited to put things in their right place or establish justice. And I would like to end on a quote from The Goal of the Wise, our gospel uh, written by Abu Sadiq Abdullah Hashim, that states, Plato's Republic is the divine just state. We are fighting for the creation of Plato's Republic, a government where God appoints the king, and the king appoints the ruling class, and the warrior class enforces the obedience towards the king and protects the state, while the producing class lives in justice and equality and never has to suffer anything or fear anything at all and enjoy a wealthy and comfortable life. Thank you very much for listening to my presentation. What criterion, if any, would you use to decide whether the Ayatollah Khomeini was a um, philosopher king? Oh, okay, that's a very good question, actually. That, that goes back to uh, what, what we call the, the law of knowing the vicegerent of God. And the, the, the law of knowing the vicegerent of God. You'll find it uh, written about in more detail in the, the booklet, which is inside of your, your welcome packets. But uh, I can just summarize it briefly. We believe that there are three aspects which are present in a vicegerent of God. And the first aspect is really the most important, and that is divine appointment. So just like Jesus said in the Bible that if he testifies about his own self, his testimony is not true, but another testifies about him, and that, that is John the Baptist, and that is Moses. He, he claimed to be uh, the person who was written about by the prophets and messengers who came before him. And he was appointed by his predecessor, which is John the Baptist. Um, so the person who is a true vicegerent of God, like it was mentioned earlier, we, we believe that there is an unbroken chain, meaning there's always a vicegerent of God uh, present upon the earth. And that individual is, is divinely appointed, and his name is mentioned in a will by his predecessor, or he is appointed. 
or uh, anointed, as we see happening several times throughout the Old Testament of the Bible. Uh, one prophet or vicegerent, uh, he anoints his successor or he names his successor. So uh, what differentiates somebody like uh, Khamenei from Abu Sadiq, uh, Abdul Hashim, peace be upon him, is that Abu Sadiq was mentioned in the will of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him and his family. Prophet Muhammad left a will uh, before he passed away. And this will named his successors after him, which is the 12 Imams. And then he named the first three Mahdi's after that. So uh, the name of Abu Sadiq and the name of Ahmed Hassan, they are in this will. And this is a will that exists in the, the narration books of uh, Sunni and Shia Muslims. So it is not something that is a new text. It is something that has actually existed all of this time. Uh, but these figures were the first to ever claim that will. And uh, that is a proof because the will is divinely protected. So that is one of the first uh, three criteria. It's uh, the first criteria of the three. Uh, the second is divine knowledge. And uh, the third is the call to the, the supremacy of God. So uh, these three things must be present in a true philosopher king. And that's what differentiates them from other people who are false claimants or wolves in sheep's clothing.